Good morning. Good morning and welcome. Thank you for joining us this morning for our Promise Pathways Forum. A, a couple, uh, couple general um, uh, pieces of, of information. The first one is we are recording this session for those who aren't able to attend other one of the sessions. So you're aware of that. When we get into the questions part, we'll be bringing our microphone around so we can capture your questions um, clearly um, for the, the future uh, uh, viewers. Uh, second, um, we have lots of pizza back there that will go to waste, so please feel free to eat um, as we do this forum. Um, I am Greg Peterson, Vice President for Student Support Services. Um, I have with me um, my co-chair for the Promise Pathways uh, agenda, uh, Shauna Hageman, um, our DSPS counselor extraordinaire. And then also uh, joining us today from our coordinating team is Gaither Lowenstein, our vice, uh, vice president for academic affairs. So with that, we'll jump in. Thank you for coming today. Um, I'm just gonna go over a little bit of the background and the history. I usually don't need a microphone. Uh, so the Promise Pathways was sort of born out of um, the seamless education movement that you, I'm sure you're all aware of, which was the partnership with Long Beach Unified, Long Beach City College, and Cal State Long Beach that started back in 1995. Um, our Long Beach College Promise began March of 2008, and it began as a, a fee waiver type of situation where, where the students, if they came directly from Long Beach Unified School District and enrolled in their first semester here at Long Beach City College had their tuition waived. And we found that they were more successful and we kept students longer if they would come directly from high school to college. So that was the first part of the encouragement. And since we were giving them free tuition, we thought maybe we should maybe support them while they're here and hence Long Beach, the Promise Pathways Long Beach City College was born. Ready? So the vision statement for Promise Pathways is uh, our goal is to transform students' experiences by changing structures to create focused and integrated pathways for all Long Beach City College students to enroll, progress, and complete their educational goals. And we're doing that through several different ways by uh, prescriptive enrollment, um, encouraging the early identification of educational goals, and achievement coaching. So those are some of the pieces of the promise. The mission statement for the Promise Pathways movement is to uh, hopefully increase the rate at which students complete college level work. Uh, we all know that the quicker they come in and the quicker they get out, the, the quicker they can pursue their goals, the quicker they're gonna get out, the more successful they are, and that they will persist and will retain them longer. Um, and then they will achieve their educational and career goals while pursuing the equity and the outcomes. Me. So, um, as we're looking at Promise Pathway, our goal is to, our goal really is to find a new way of serving all of our students here at Long Beach City College. And so, we are starting with the idea of scaling this up. So, we're starting with a small cohort. Um, it's, it's a large cohort in the extent that typically cohorts are about 30, 60, 50. Um, and we're looking at a cohort of potentially up to 1,600. Right now it's about 1,100 um, students who have, um, who have uh, opted into Promise Pathways. But if you look to see kind of the extent of this, we, we rec recognize we're starting small in the larger scheme of things. So 73% of our students are returning students. 27% um, are new students, and of that new student cohort coming in each year, 5% represent uh, uh, Long Beach Unified School District. So it kind of gives you a sense of the scale of this. Our goal is really, as I mentioned, is really to build this experience for all students at Long Beach City College. And so you can see that we have used the term phasing as we move through this. There's a lot we want to accomplish, but it's going to take us time to implement. And so we've identified some key components, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, and then we've talked about additional components as we learn and grow to apply for our students. And then the idea is that we would expand this for additional students um, across so other new students other continuing students as we learn what works the idea is to expand this so this becomes the experience for every student here at the college 
So you can see in a real quick overview. Um, what we have done is we have, uh, we have created a, really what's a contract with Promise Pathway students. So we've said, in essence what we've said is, we as educators, we've, there's a lot of research out there, we've done a lot of work, and we actually know what helps students be successful. And often what happens in college is that we emphasize choice. So what we do is we say the most important part of your college experience is the choice to decide what you're going to do. But in that choice, often students don't know um, what's successful. And so we're saying, we actually have an idea of what's successful. We're gonna build this model for you and we're gonna expect you to do these things. So you're gonna give up some choice, but in return, we're gonna give you some benefits. Um, so that's the incentive there. So that's the agreement we created. Right now, we're again, scaling. So we started with a full-time cohort. Our goal is as we learn to expand this so part-time students could participate as well. Um, We've been looking at, we've implemented placement pilot models with Long Beach Unified um, and prioritized scheduling. So we're finding ways to really look at how students perform in high school and then link that to their success here in college and place based on that performance. Um, we are emphasizing, uh, we're front loading their courses. So we know that they need math, English, and reading to be successful. Um, in general, in, in general in the past, so about, a third of our students who need coming in for Long Beach Unified who needed English their first semester would take English. So now we're requiring all of them to take English. So these courses they need English, math, reading to be successful, we're front loading those. Um, we're also including a student success course so this, that, that will help connect the semesters together and create that learning community support structure throughout the experience. Uh, the focus again is we're, we're trying to work, we've been working really uh, hard with um, our counselors and with our departments on identifying courses so that we can place students based on their interests as soon as possible to get them into their pathways um, towards their majors. And um, we have developed, we're developing additional structures of support. One that Shauna mentioned was the coaching components. So we're piloting a coaching model to see how we can provide additional support outside of the classroom to help these students be successful moving through this process. Again, with all of these pieces, our goal really is to, um, to figure out, to identify what works, and then scale this so this becomes the Long Beach City College experience. We turn that over to Gaither. Well, one, of the nice, one of the nice things about a project like this is that it enables you to try some interventions that you believe are gonna have a positive impact on student success, but you're not totally sure yet. So when you have a, a cohort of, whether it's 11,000 or 1,000 or 800 students, all coming in as first time freshmen, um, you, you've, you've got a built in population there that you can try different interventions uh, and design it sort of experimentally so you can get an idea of what works and what doesn't. So we're gonna take full advantage of this opportunity with this first Promise Pathways cohort. And we're gonna pilot at least three different types of things. And the first of those three things is placement pilots. Uh, for those of you that don't know, we typically place community college students into English and math based on their performance on a standardized assessment test. Um, and, and historically colleges have done this. Uh, some have liked it, some have felt that it wasn't a legitimate indicator of a student's prospects for success. Well, there's other research out there that suggests that a, a very positive indicator of a student's likelihood to succeed in college level English and math is how they did in high school. So what we're gonna be able to do is pilot this and rather than have them take the standardized test that we would typically administer uh, to an incoming freshman student, we would look at their performance in, in the, their last high school class in English and math and if they got an A or a B in that, we will place them in college level English or math. And we believe that that will provide uh, just as much, if not better, of an indication of their likelihood for success than the standardized test that we typically have administered to students. We're gonna be able to measure it and we're going to be able to determine whether or not this alternative uh, placement instrument makes sense. And if it does, uh, we will have learned something that will be applicable to all students and that's gonna be a very valuable contribution of this, of this, of this Pathways program. Similarly, with respect to reading, um, there, there are, are various uh, theories as to whether or not 
<clears throat> reading courses are beneficial to incoming students who have skill deficiencies in reading, or whether the manner in which we've traditionally delivered reading courses is the most effective way you could possibly do it. So again, we're gonna have a second pilot project where we, get, we take a look at incoming students who test in below college level in reading, and we try different things with different cohorts of students. One cohort of students, we will say, okay, you tested in pre-collegiate in reading, you won't take a reading class your first semester. You'll take a math class and we'll see how you, that cohort fares. Another group of students will take reading the way we've always offered reading, in a traditional sort of standalone reading course that is not connected to any particular course in the curriculum. And the third group will be a group that takes reading paired with a subject matter course. And so that the reading instructor will work with the instructor of that course to which the reading section is paired and the students will have an opportunity to do their reading for that class, let's say it's an anthropology class. They'll have a chance to do their anthropology reading and work on it with a reading instructor in the reading class. So it's more of a contextualized approach to teaching learning, uh, reading. And so what we'll do is we'll be able to study the retention, persistence, and success rates of these students using these three different methods of teaching reading to see if any of these approaches yields better success than the others. And again, our goal is to identify what works best so that we can then provide it that way to a larger number of students. And finally, with respect to coaches, the idea of the, one of the components of the Promise pro program is that each kid, each student, incoming student will have a coach. Well, we believe that having a coach uh, will contribute to their success. We don't know this for a fact. So rather than just go out and, and hire a, a thousand coaches, and give every student a coach, we're gonna pilot it. We're gonna pilot coaching in different ways. We're gonna try embedding coaches in student success courses. We're gonna try offering coaches outside of the classroom context, and we're gonna have some students that don't have coaches. And once again, we're gonna measure the impact of coaching in different modalities uh, on student retention, persistence, and success. And from these pilots, we're gonna be able to do further refinements in the Promise program and further refinements in what we offer to all of our students so that we can learn more about what contributes to student success and then apply it. Um, all of this is gonna be designed so that we can research it and measure it. And again, we're gonna maintain what works, we're gonna expand what works, and we will <coughs> not continue what apparently is not working. Another thing that has come up, another question that has come up frequently is, is to what extent are Promise Pathways incoming freshmen going to displace current students uh, from getting classes? And, and we want to address this question uh, uh, up front. First of all, you need to know that we have a real significant challenge in the state of California, and that is that <coughs> because of the way community colleges <coughs> admit students and register students, incoming students from high schools are at a dramatic disadvantage in terms of getting courses that they need. In fact, last year we turned away 140,000 incoming freshmen statewide who were not able to get the classes that they needed. We also know from research that a student who comes directly from high school into college the very next semester has a 50% better chance of succeeding than a student who sits out for even one semester. So the state as a whole has been doing a grave disservice to recent high school graduates uh, by denying them access to classes. N not only that, but that problem becomes more acute as the CSUs and the UCs begin to slam their doors on these incoming students. But we know that something needs to be done about it, and Promise Pathways is once again a pilot intended to see what works, and, what, and it will be a relatively small number of students who are affected. Because, remember, first of all, we've only got about anywhere between 800 and 1,100 students who are going to sign the contract and take all of the steps necessary to be eligible for priority registration. And secondly, we're going to have essentially the same number of sections this year as we did last year. Last fall we had 2,253 2, sections. This fall we're going to have 2,242 sections, so 11 fewer sections. But we're also going to work with the faculty members and the department heads to achieve some efficiencies in the schedule to make sure that in effect, more seats are gonna be available to students in the fall than there were available last fall. And finally, a lot of the 
Promise Pathway students, the sections that they're going to be enrolling in are sections that would not have existed without Promise Pathways. So we're going to designate these sections for Promise Pathways students, and these are not going to be taking away seats from current students. So the overall impact on current students is going to be uh, relatively minimal. Um, there are also some things going on at the state level in terms of assessment, in terms of orientation, and in terms of perhaps priority registration that if implemented in the fall will have the effect of making more seats available uh, to students than ever before. So I think it's been a little bit overblown in terms of the effect that the small cohort of Promise Pathway students is going to have on the ability of our continuing students to get the classes that they need. What we'd like to do is move into a question and answer phase. Uh, as we do this, what I'd like to do is um, everyone who has participated on one of the Promise Pathways initiative groups, um, if you could stand for a second so you could see those. So we've got some um, we've got additional expertise in the audience that as you're asking a question, we might defer to one of our experts on our initiative groups um, with your questions. So we've got a microphone here um, coming around. So if you want to raise your hand, then um, we'll bring you the microphone and we'll see what questions we can respond to. Um, you said this place, one of the incentives that the Promise Pathway students were receiving is specialized counseling. For the current students, they have to call or come in on Mondays to book an appointment for the following week. Usually appointments get booked up within one or two days at both campuses. So since April 24, the school has been prioritizing students for Mondays and Wednesdays from 2 to 7. I went ahead and looked at the numbers for the current students that would have been seen and since April 30th through May 2nd, 84 students. May 7th through May 9th, 84 students. From May 14th to May 16th, 84 students. The schedule following is 84 students being bypassed at LEC. Yet, I'm coming towards the end, Mark Taylor. Well, basically, how is it that these Promise Pathway students from Monday through Wednesdays are getting counseling from two to seven at a time when summer registration is happening and the fall schedule is on the rise. Okay, I'm good. Okay. So oh, we recognize across the board, um, regardless of the student population, um, we have, we do not have enough counseling services to support all of our students. We know that that's a statewide issue. Um, what we've done with Promise Pathways is we've created a different model of doing counseling. And so it's not the traditional model where, you're, um, where students are receiving a half hour uh, with a counselor. What we've done is, through a lot of work with our counseling initiative and our counselors, we've created, um, a, we've created a first semester schedule form that's actually pre-populated based upon their assessment scores, based upon their high school uh, performance data. Um, based upon the pilots that we're doing. And so we're, we've changed the model where there's a group structure and then the, student, the counselor is spending less one-on-one -on -one time with the students. So in essence, what we're trying to do is find different models to really respond to um, efficiencies in meeting student need. So there is some displacement, um, but ultimately we're, we're seeing more students in this process. And for counseling, um, again, we're responsible for all students coming in during this time. Nisha. In addition to that. Hello. Okay. In addition to the schedule in terms of the workshops, what we've been able to do because we're utilizing an online form to actually secure student appointments for or requests for the workshops, as we see the demand for those workshops, we're able to more quickly adjust our counseling schedule so that if we don't have the demand in the workshops, we're now able to release counselors that would have been assigned to those workshops back into the counseling department to see students in, a, in other forms. So I think because of the use of technology, we're able to better accommodate the need for both Promise Pathway students as well as our current students. The 
it's a pretty cool program. Uh, you're going to have different models, and you don't quite sure know what's going to happen, but you're going to try to find the best models that work. How do you measure success, and are you going to publish those success numbers for your targets for success, and also are you going to measure the cost of each model and publish the cost of each model? Yeah, those are great questions, and yeah, it is a, it is a pretty cool program. Um, we have some sort of standardized indicators that are, that are typically used to measure student success, and those are things like successful course completion rates, i.e. the percentage of students who, who get a C or better in a course, term-to-term uh, -term persistence, which is the percentage of students who are in the fall semester who come back for the spring semester, and also year-to-year -year retention, the percentage of fall students who are still around for the following fall. And we're going to be able to compare the Promise Pathways cohort as well as the sub-cohorts in reading and coaching and the like uh, to the comparison groups to see which of these interventions has the most significant impact on those indicators. But those are rather um, generic or general indicators of student success. And everybody knows that if you want to have a 100% success rate in your class, you just give everybody a C. And all of a sudden, wow, I'm a great teacher. So you really need to go beyond that. And that is where the, the course level and program level student learning outcomes measures really come into play. Uh, all of these courses in which these students are going to be enrolled have course level student learning outcome measures. And we're going to be able to take a look at those measures and see how the pathway students and the students in the sub-cohorts perform on those student learning outcomes measures in relation to students who are not in pathways or are not in the cohorts. We're going to approach this very rigorously from a research standpoint, and we'll be able to publish and generally circulate to the college community and beyond the results of what we've found. Help? So what about the cost? Oh, cost, yeah. Yeah, some of, these, some of these programs are probably going to be more costly than others. Now, we're taking some steps to minimize the cost. For example, for, the, for coaches, um, there, for, for graduate students that are in counseling programs, they need to have a certain number of hours of, of unpaid internship uh, in order to qualify for their graduate credential. So we're going to try to enlist a lot of those folks to serve as coaches, and that, that is a relatively uh, low-cost program. Um, and so we're looking at, first of all, the most cost-effective ways of delivering these services, and secondly, once we have an idea of what works and what doesn't, we will then also take into consideration the cost of, of expanding that. We talk about this program being scalable, but but if, if it, it needs to be scalable at an appropriate uh, cost, and we'll have to factor that in and publish those data as well. trying to figure out the math of this and the level of displacement and it's again it's cool it's a great idea but it was explained to me yesterday by one of our researchers that in the English department they're really not adding new classes what they've done is they have um, changed the classes they're offerings they ch they're changing to more English one offerings uh, eliminating 801 offerings um, if every one of those 800 students say need an English class or go right into an English class, um, are there enough sections and seats for the current amount of enrollment that would be seeking them as well, or the math or whatever? I'll take a, I'll take a whack at that. First of all, there never seem to be enough English and math sections for everyone, and that's not going to change when we implement this program. Uh, what's going to change is that, that these Promise Pathway students, because of the fact that they are signing the contract and they're engaging in the various things we're asking them to do are going to be able to get their English and math classes in their first semester of study, okay? They're, if they did not take those classes, they would be taking other classes somewhere in the school anyway. They would be displacing students from those sections. So instead what we did was we created additional sections of English and math to try to serve as many of those promised students as possible without displacing more students from English and math. What that should do is free up the seats in the other classes that these incoming freshmen might have otherwise enrolled in. 
Overall, seats are going to remain scarce, particularly in English and math, and there's really not a lot we can do about that until we start getting more apportionment revenue. Let me ask a question. What did you do your first slide you show us, or the first one you mentioned, that is that they might well have been turned away and not displacing students, right? They right. They not just be here. Right, so the way, the way we started with, so English is a good example. So we looked at actual enrollments for last year, and we looked at the percentage of, of incoming students who actually got a seat in last year's courses. And then we looked at the rest of the students who did not have a seat, and we added all of those additional seats. So the total number of seats that were available for continuing students last year is the same number this year. So we, we added additional seats. So the total number of, stu of seats for continuing students in English, math, and reading stayed the same this year, last year to this year. Now as Gaither mentioned, last year we didn't have enough for everyone, so they still won't serve everyone. But we were, we were very uh, thoughtful in making sure that we were minimizing that impact. I think the other part that um, was probably uh, in the explanation from the research office was the, um, as we use these alternative uh, uh, placement models, um, we're seeing that more students, based on their performance in high school, have a greater predictor of being successful based on that performance, are placing higher in the English sequence which would mean that the subsequent semester, we would be required to offer less of the, the, the courses. So if more students are placing into English 1 instead of 801, then you have to offer less 105s the following semester. So there's some displacement there. That's another thing that we need to keep in mind about this program, is that if we are successful, and if more of these students progress quickly through their, their curriculum, then, then actually a lot of the seats that are being taken now are being taken by students who repeatedly fail courses. And if we can, if we can use ba what we know about available student success research in order to make students progress further and in order to decrease the amount of time they spend here, then ultimately more seats will be available to all students. And also, the, the instructors who teach the college level classes are going to have better prepared students in those classes once they've had their English, their math, and their there are a lot of extremely positive things that are, that are going to come out of this program. I don't need a microphone. Uh, <laughs> how are you going to guarantee that that student from high school can meet English 1 or 105? And you all know I don't teach either. But I'll, I'll give you good examples because I taught history for a long, long time. Just because they did well in high school, sometimes that doesn't mean that they are proficient in grammar. Literature, yes, but what about grammar? Well, right now, um, how, how many of you guys, uh, how many faculty members do we have here? How many of you would say that, that in your college level classes, uh, more than 50% of your students are proficient in grammar? So I guess what I'm saying is, what we're doing now is, is really feeding the bulldog. Um, <laughs> we think that, that, that we have nothing to lose by trying an alternative placement model. We will study it. We'll see if it's any better or any worse than the uh, placement model that preceded it. But we're not going to go into this thing thinking that we got all the answers. But we are going to go into this thing knowing that we have some best practices that we can test, and we're going to measure to see what works. Uh, it still seems like a contradiction. Um, we're cutting back on classes, but there's going to be classes available for freshmen. So where are they coming from? Out of luck, I've uh, been trying to stats for two semesters now. Failed even with professional pride registration. Haven't been able to get a class C. Um, so how's that gonna? Am I gonna be a bad? Am I forced to be a four-year long as a college student? You've been trying to get stat for two two semesters now. Yes. Okay. Well, this will pro this will not affect that at all because these it's a school wide thing. Right. It's we. I, you know, we are not in a position where we can alleviate that school-wide problem right now. And this is a statewide problem. Um, you know, we need a lot more sections of, of classes to meet the needs of students like yourself, and we're not going to be able to get there uh, in, in, unless we get additional uh, revenue from somewhere that we don't currently have. Uh, this particular program will neither uh, make your situation better or make it worse. I'm a career tech ed person, 
so I have a concern about your program. It seems to be focused elsewhere. And what are you going to do for Promise Pathways for someone that wants to be an automobile mechanic who may actually have a better chance of getting a job today than that person going through your English class and uh, the other vocational programs we have here? in Promise Pathways. Um, so if a student, can, we're encouraging the students to enroll in English, reading, and math, but if a student comes in and identifies an educational goal of auto mechanics or culinary arts, that's gonna be number one, and we're gonna be able to put them into those classes. We're just asking that they also take a success course. So it could be a combination of auto mechanics and a success course, so they have the support and the opportunity to work with an educational coach. So the question was, um, as a community college, how are we making the Long Beach community aware of the program, of uh, Promise Pathways? Uh, we have, <laughs> well, we, um, uh, we've been working, uh, we have been doing a lot of work to make this happen uh, quickly. So we've put in about a year and a half on, on creating this amazingly intricate program and getting it in place for fall 2012. So we um, have taken some opportunities uh, that have been available. Primarily, we've been working with Long Beach Unified and working with parents. We've had parent um, orientation sessions. We've worked really closely with their counselors. Um, they've done a lot of outreach for us to communicate with students who would be participating. Um, so a lot of our work right now with the community has been through Long Beach Unified, really to attract students. Um, we've had an opportunity to speak to some community groups in general about the program. Uh, as we get this program in place, uh, in the fall, then we'll look for more opportunity to, to communicate and share out um, as it grows. So right now, our main, our, our main communication has been with Long Beach Unified and really working with counselors and parents and students to be able to, to uh, know about it and be able to participate. I'll give you some numbers. So if you saw about the 100%, 73% is returning students, 27% um, are new, uh, new students. So you, you figure um, we get about 27,000 students. Uh, we were at 30,000, but because of all the budget cuts, we're down to about 27,000. Of the 27,000, uh, 1,600 come from Long Beach Unified. Of the 1,600 that we reached out to, we reached out to all Long Beach Unified students. Uh, we have about 1,100 that have shown initial interest in the program. Um, we assume that between now and the fall, there's always some attrition in student participation, so we assume that between 800 and 1,000 will participate. So we're looking at about 800 to 1,000 students of 27,000 students. That kind of gives you a broader sense of, of size. So if you had English and you received an interview, you'll be, you'll be placed accordingly. If you received a score below that, a grade below that, Correct. So, um, just so everyone can hear that, the, if a student with an alternative placement, if they receive an A or a B, then they'll be placed based on that grade. If they don't receive an A or B in the course, then it defaults back to our current assessment process, and so they will be would be placed based on their Accuplacer score. Math, math is fun, right? So, um, so English, and that's my background. English, we like it simple, A or B. It's simple, easy to measure. Math are statisticians, so they got creative. Um, and they looked at all the different indicators that um, perceived. So uh, what our research office did is they looked at a cohort, a fi uh, five-year co five cohort, 6,000 students coming directly out of Long Beach Unified. And so they looked for what indicators were the best predictors of student performance, of success here when they arrived. Um, our Accuplacer was a predictor, and it was a really good predictor of where they got placed, because that's why we use it, and it predicted to some level success. 
But stronger predictors for English were their actual performance in their senior year English course. And so that's why we chose the A and the B for the pilot. For the math course, um, we have we have already in place, we have the Accuplacer, which students take here to be placed for math. Also in our catalog, we allow students, if they bring in their transcript, to be placed if they receive an A or a B um, based on their math course in high school. So that option still exists based on our, our, our catalog. And then the third option, the math department looked at multiple variables, um, one of them being the overall GPA their senior year, um, their grades in math, um, their, call, their California standardized test scores. So they looked at a variety of variables because they're smart like that and they created a formula um, that uses multiple variables for placement. For reading. Yeah, the math people turn it over to Mr. Spock and I, I don't really understand it, but I can explain the reading. Um, if you test, we, we do a, pla uh, a placement test for reading. If you test into proficiency, you don't take reading. You take math your first semester. If you test more than three levels below college level in reading, uh, we're gonna try a, a different method of teaching reading to those students. We're gonna base it out of the learning support center so that those students get more supplemental instruction and more hands-on support. And then you've got three, lev three levels of reading that fall below college level. That would be your 82, your 882, and your 883. For those th uh, students at those levels, we're gonna divide them into three different cohorts one of whom will take reading the way we've always taught reading, whatever they place into. Another third of those students will not take reading. They'll take math and move on. And a third group of students will take reading paired with an appropriate subject matter course. So that they're getting their subject matter course, having an opportunity within the reading class to do more work on that textbook, on that reading. And we're going to try each of those three different approaches to see which is the most effective in terms of imparting reading skills to students and promoting their success. Let me ask you a question, another one. Oh well, if you raise your hand, I'll stop. Um, <laughs> um, Gaither and I have talked about that, uh, that, that integrative approach. And of course, I love it, sign me up. But I assume I don't get to sign in my poli sci class. I assume that those reading pairings will go with courses that have been self-identified as courses they can take in the first year, is that correct? Do you know which ones you ask departments to send you classes? Right, we taken. started out with, the, with by asking the departments which of the courses that you offer that are college level are most appropriate for students at these reading levels. And then from that larger subset of courses, we had a meeting and we invited in the teachers of those courses with the reading teachers and we, we were able to come up with pairings based on that. And so we believe that it's, it's, it's not just throwing darts at a board, um, it's not pr completely precise, but we think we have a good shot and have some pretty good pairings in place to test this model. So I don't get one. You didn't ask. <laughs> I just uh, wanted to just actually um, add a little bit to what Ashley's question uh, about the community outreach. Um, and just, all, I think besides uh, what Vice President Peterson said about going out to all the high schools, there's a really an extensive outreach process. All the uh, counseling offices, all the high schools were visited. And we also got really great coverage, um, not just locally, but regionally as far as media. We were in all the major, the, the initiative has been in all the major news publications. And if you haven't had a chance to see, uh, just this last Sunday, there was a really great front page story in the press telegram, but also I mentioned some of the Promise Pathways uh, initiatives and what's kind of uh, happening on campus. So there's been a really great saturation, I think, of, of community coverage. Forgive me if this was already asked and answered. Um, is there a possibility of a cap in the Let's say, for example, the English class where we have 70% as pathways, 30% returning students. So the student feels as if they're in, you know, the climate is, I'm in a new environment. I'm out of high school. I'm into college. I think one of the most motivating things is the freedom that a college student feels leaving high school. So I was wondering if, th if that is at all been talked about to, to continue to help create that returning and, you know, the, 
the diversity that the college classroom provides? Good question. So uh, the, the work, um, the structure for Promise Pathways, all, our, all of our initiative groups are a, um, a collection of, of administrators and faculty. And in those key areas specifically for all of the pilot courses, they've all been department driven. So really the faculty have been leading those, those conversations. Um, the English faculty very early on felt that the best model would be blending um, Promise Pathway students in across the, the different courses. So that they wouldn't just be a course for all Promise Pathway students, but they would be interspersed with the students. And so that's the model that's been adopted. Um, math, the same. Um, and uh, The reading courses that are specifically assigned to a paired course, those reading sections will be all Promise Pathway students. And you need to set it up that way for the research design. But the reading students who are, who are not placed in the paired courses, those can be blended sections. Uh, also, the paired course itself can be either blended or all, all Promise Pathway students, and that's at the discretion of the instructor of the paired course. So it's, a, it's going to be a combination of blended sections and all Promise Pathway sections, depending upon which particular course you're talking about. And, and how do we maintain that it's blended? I mean, how do we ensure that it's blended? How do we ensure that it's not an entire classroom of Promise Pathways students? Well, if a student is enrolling in a, in a reading course that's not one of those pairs, those reading courses will be open to other students as well. And similarly, with respect to the paired course, let's say you, have, you pair a Reading 82 with a Cultural Anthropology course. There's 30 students in that Reading 82 course. Cultural Anthropology can be capped at 40 or 45. So once those, those students populate that section, the remainder of those seats are available. But the non-paired course... As, as well as, um, so the detail piece, uh, um, this first semester, until we work out all the, the magic to make it happen smoothly, um, admissions and records will be doing that initial enrollment for those students. And so I think that the, the formula that the English department has been talking about is no more than 12 or 13. Um, students will be placed into each one. So they, they That's stop. really important information that I don't think most faculty know. No more than 12 or 13 Promise Pathway students in each class? In, the, for, in these blended courses like the English courses, yes. I mean, that's, that's again, the conversations that working with the English department that they've been um, playing out. Thank you. Uh, well, we have more. <laughs> I just wondered if there is some kind of time frame or expectation for the students that enter the cohort. Are they, you know, mandated to be done in two years or that kind of thing? Well, what we'd like is yes. Um, what, uh, the goal of Promise Pathway is to help students be successful. It's not to weed them out. Um, we're building all these interventions in. So as long as students are making progress, towards their goal, we're going to support them. But the idea is by building this structure that they're going to be able to complete sooner. Um, you know, we know, we do things that, and, and again, this is one of our chances to try these things out so we can scale them. A great example is in, in counseling, we create um, ed plans for students, and then a student goes to get their, their courses, right, and they can't get a single course on their ed plan. And so then they have to, they try to get courses. Many of them are trying to get 12 units for financial aid reasons. And so they're grabbing courses where they can. And then they come back and it's this, this matter of then trying to create an ed plan based on the courses that they've taken. And so, you know, it's, it's counterintuitive to help students be successful and move forward. And so by trying to clean these, clear, these clearer pathways so students can move through more uh, quickly and giving them the support, we're hoping that, um, that really students will be able to complete within two years I'm um, three years tops. Let's say that I'm a promise pathway student coming into the fall. I mean that I took the assessment and I have any place in English one to five. And I have place in English one and later in stats one. And that I fulfilled the reading proficiency, meaning that I have seven units. What else can that promise pathway student take? If you're English, math, and you don't have reading, meaning you have those two courses plus the success course, what do you take? What else do you take? I'm talking about English one and stats 
So if you've got, for all of our students, so you would be placed into English and math, and then all of our students in Promise Pathways are required to participate in the Student Success course. Um, we have two of them this first semester we're using. So we're using Learn 11, which is a three unit course, and Counseling, which is a one unit, so you'd be placed into one of those courses. And then we've worked with all of the departments across the college to identify what would be appropriate first, um, first uh, semester courses based upon your, um, your major. So what your academic goal is. And so that's where we would work from. So the learning leverage and counseling one would be an elective, right? No other courses that can the other students say, right? Maybe like an anthro, or psych, or sociology, those would be elective, right? No, no. So you would take, you take your math and you take your English. All students are required to take one of those success courses. And then in addition, to round out based upon the number of units left, there, you would take an elective course. An elective course would be based upon this list of courses that were provided by the departments for what would be appropriate for the first semester. But I thought Can I help maybe explain it a little bit? You'd be, you're working with a counselor that would help you choose that class based on your major and your educational goal. So the class that you would be choosing you would receive counseling um, and you would be able to choose the course that would make sense for your major. So if your major would be psychology or social work, you could take a psychology course. But what would you do for math and English? No, all of the courses, all of the students have prescriptive registration, which means math, reading, English, and their elective, and their success. It changed. It changed. One of the things I want to add to that is that even though we have a grouping of appropriate electives, if a student has reading proficiency, a lot of them are being able to go into a, a elective course that is close to their major or something that they're interested in. Because the key of it is, as important as English reading and math is, that makes for a boring student semester. And we've talked about this many a times. So we try to, at least the counselors are really looking and hearing what the student want. And for example, we have a lot of RN students coming through. We have some individuals want to go into culinary arts, one of the CT areas. And what we're trying to do is to keep those units down. Uh, many a times, students have walked out and they have 13, maybe 15 units. A little scary, but many of them want to do this and, it, and they are very passionate about it. And what I find that what we're seeing thus far, we saw 100 students last week, many of them, this is plan A for them. And so they're very direct, they very want to get involved. Many of them have already seen counselors without going through the uh, uh, a logarithm, for lack of better wording, uh, as far as what their placement is. And so now we're correcting that, obviously, in the sessions. But we're definitely trying to identify something that will keep them here so that they can, one, complete, two, persist. And so we have to hear what they want. And so we're, we're making those changes accordingly based on what the student is sharing with us and stuff. But obviously, as we're already hearing, admissions and records will enroll them. And they're going to get what they want because they're enrolling in a priority status or being enrolled in a priority status. A lot of those classes will not be closed at all for them. So they will get those courses. You guys said that uh, basically that admissions and records will have the students register for their classes. Will they be given that assistance for the following semester? That's, um, that's a conversation we're having right now. Again, trying to figure out um, how do we build these models to support students through. You know, if we help students uh, start their pathways, um, and then we, again, graduate these models where they can't get the goals that they need, then we, we move them off these pathways. So those are the conversations we're having to see as we move students forward. I'm looking at our time. It looks like we have uh, one more minute. Um, and then, um, then we're heading over to our next forum at PCC at 1230. Why don't... It just...
following up on what you said. So they're going to continue to give me, how long will they have priority registration for? Their whole career here, once they're identified in the pathways? Um, we are, that's a conversation we're still working through. Um, I'll tell you again, we've been working on this for 18 months. Um, we are uh, amazed at how we pull things together and that we're going to be implementing for fall. Um, and the conversations continue. So the fact that we've been able to start conversations about the spring are very refreshing. Um, you know, we initially had talked about this as a four semester model. Um, you know, and some people have said, well, only four, not six. And so really the conversation is, well, right now we're on one. And we're almost to two, and we're really excited about that. Um, and then we'll continue these conversations again um, through all of our initiative groups. Um, and, and again, we've got uh, 60, about 60 people involved in these different initiative groups talking through implications and building this. And so there will be more um, discussion of that as well. Um, again, I want to thank everyone for coming this morning and uh, joining us. Please uh, take pizza with you. Um, if you have any additional questions that weren't answered today, um, feel free to, uh, to email, you send me an email at gpeterson at lbcc.edu um, and we'll, um, we'll follow up with you. Thank you again.